Hey everybody, welcome to Rocky Tropics Gardening. This is my What Am I Planting Next video. And if you watched my videos before, you'll probably know I plant most of my things by seed. And uh, so this will be for the diehards, the ones that really want to plant seeds and uh, talk seeds. You know who you are. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, today's a little bit warm. We've got about 80% humidity. It's the middle of the the, uh, the, dry, the wet season. This is planting for the dry season. So that overlap kind of kind of time. So uh, yeah, it's about 27, 30 degrees, 80, 86 Fahrenheit at the moment. And uh, it's kind of nicer outside. I've got a fan up on the veranda under um, where I'm, under where I'm sitting. So the fan makes it a bit nicer to sit here. Anyway. That's where I am and what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so the basics that I use to uh, get my seed planting started off for the season is I have to work out which season is coming up and what I can get away with, what I should or shouldn't do, and you've got to think ahead. So this is the tropics, so I actually tried to look up my first and last frost date, which I'd never heard of. Actually, I've been planting gardens for at least 30 years and I, and I have not had not heard about it until about five or six years ago I didn't know how important it was if I had heard about it but uh, if you're somewhere where it gets frost please look that up because you have to put all of your plants within that amount of time when you plant the seed when you're actually going to put it out in the garden you can't have the frost coming if it's going out in the garden unless it's a really frost hardy plant but I'm sure there are lots of videos from other people Roots and Refuge are pretty good for that, talking about first and last frost dates. But this is a, a tropical channel, so I'm going to stick with what I know. Well, what I'm actually doing now, I used to live in a frosty place. <laughs> Definitely not anymore. So yeah, I looked, tried to look up my first and last frost date the other day on the internet. Nothing, no maps, no anything. Uh, we're at quite a high elevation, as I've said before. Uh, we're over 800 metres above sea, mat, sea level which in some parts of the world would give us snow, but we don't get snow. <laughs> we get occasional frosts probably once every one or two years. Uh, definitely not every year, like I used to in Victoria when I lived in Melbourne. So they would get, I don't know, five, five or six on average, I would say. I haven't looked it up, but that's what it seems like. Excuse me, there's so many bugs here. <laughs> I've covered myself in citronella oil and, and uh, and the carrier oil, like you're not supposed to put it straight on your skin, but not all bugs are warded off by that, so I'll just have to wave them away whenever they turn up. Anyway, talking about frost dates. So I might get a frost in July or August. I've been um, trying to make a note of when we actually do get a frost. We didn't get one the year before last, but last year we got a frost. No, last year we didn't get a frost. The year before last, it was so bad that I could actually scratch the frost with my fingernail on the on the uh, car windscreen. The car was left out overnight, so um, that's that's interesting. We have some friends who were only about ten minutes up the road, and they got ten to twelve frosts a year in past past times. They don't so much get that anymore. But they live in a valley with a creek running through it, so the cold air would go down there, so they would get more frosts there. But they're still at a similar elevation. I think they're even higher up above sea level than we are. But anyway, it's very bad for bananas. Kills bananas often. Uh, a really bad frost. There was a black frost here years ago that a lot of locals tell us about. But uh, that is definitely an exception, not the rule here with frosts. But anyway, so my essentials that I use is a large but any old kind of notepad. I write down the date. I usually try to keep them in, you know, groups of tomatoes, groups of leafy greens, groups of whatever. I used to do the uh, botanical name, botanical genus, is it? The Solanaceae for tomatoes and eggplants and uh, the, um, yeah, brassicas and all those kind of things, but I've sort of given that up a little bit. So my new system 
is born out of the fact that I was having trouble uh, with it taking, well, not really having trouble, I wanted it to be faster when I was writing out plant labels for each of the seeds that I plant because as we know often we think oh we're only planting a few seeds well we'll remember which ones they are but no, it works. <laughs> I know I don't so I'm gonna be planting a bunch of them because I'm coming up to what's going to be growing in the cooler months here uh, which is actually the sunnier months it's called the dry season so it's sort of from March April until the wet season comes again which can be November December uh, a lot of people around here say if the wet season hasn't come by December it's un December or Christmas Day it's unusual but anyway I hate plastic but I have plastic for this uh, but this is my system so I've got my trusty little plant labels that I make out of bits of plastic uh, usually from a, uh, a butter container so obviously we don't have a cow we don't make our own butter sadly and we probably we never will but um even though i love the idea of that so anyway i will show you in another video how i make my little plant tags but they're tough plastic and i have tried using a permanent marker on them which lasts but certain permanent markers are better than others and sometimes you get to when the plant's a bit bigger and you still can't identify it and the label has faded so what i've actually found is the best thing is a good old pencil uh, here is a 6b so that's the softest one of the softest pencils you can easily find uh, so it writes really easily and it's visible for years uh, on these plant tags so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that so um, you can buy plastic plant tags in the in the shops if you like I find the paddle pop or anything wooden will will just rot away here with all the wet weather we get and all the other stuff in the soil so yeah for me it's a plastic tag with a 6b pencil and um, that's fantastic so I put the um, let's see so I put the kind of plant it is so like tomato or spinach or whatever it is the variety that it is uh, where I got it from so the seed company or the person that gave me the seeds or if it's my own seed I just do OS own seed and the date that the seed was planted in the little cup so here this section I've uh, taken the plant labels out of old plant pots where I've planted the plant out into the garden the vegetable or fruit or whatever it is and um, I've erased the, um, that's a bad example, I've actually kept, haven't erased, let's find a good example. So I erased the, um, I erased the date from it. So then there you've got cucum cucumber, long green is the variety, DTB is the seed company, and then there's a space for the new date there. So I've got cucumbers, fruit, grains, hot chilies, and there's a sweet chili section, uh, peppers, Americans call them, Americans and I'm sure other people call them peppers as well, but here in Australia we call them all chilies. So uh, that's my system, so I try to keep them all in groups of tomatoes, groups of cucumbers, groups of pumpkins or squash here so that's when I actually am planting the seed in there it goes on the list and so then I'll know when I planted it and I am color coding at the moment these are my colors for you know there's a color for tomatoes I'm a color coding person <laughs> tomatoes leafy greens brassicas that sort of thing so that when I look at this thing and I'm thinking oh when did I plant that I'll know it's a tomato and I planted it on such and such a day. Um, I'll also plant if I write down if DIR for direct, if I planted it direct in in the uh, in the ground or if I planted it in one of my little pots, which I don't actually have within reach at the moment. Um, but yes, so that will help me find something faster. If I think, oh, that failed, I'd better write down those seeds are no good 
or the seeds never sprouted, that sort of thing. And I've also got, of course, an eraser and a pencil sharpener. And I used to just run around for all these things every time I was planting seeds. But now I've got all my dedicated things and they just go into a little bucket. I actually, there's an, there's an advertisement. Our local Jersey milk is very good. So we try to get that. Um, yeah, I cut off milk containers um, or I have little pots. So once I've sorted my seeds out, they go in a little pot ready to plant. So if you're ready. Oh, one more thing about planning. I've just started doing this because I was doing a spreadsheet and my hubby is in IT and he goes, just do a spreadsheet, uh, which is not always the best way to keep your data. But um, for this, it would have been good. But he's using a cheap program and it locked me out and I couldn't edit it anymore so I was like <laughs> so back to paper and pencil so this is an old ledger book that uh, I think originally came from my mum she was using it so I ripped out the pages that weren't needed and um, actually this one I think was fresh she hadn't even started it um, yeah so this is um, how I'm gonna write how how well everything performed so again they're in in sections of um, what kind of plant they are so i've got um yeah if yeah i haven't done all the headings actually i thought i'd done more than i had anyway but yes when it was planted how well it did what the seed brand was what the kind of what the weather was in the notes so yeah just keep keep a, a bit of a plant journal going with that so I'll report back if I actually do it as I'm supposed to be doing it, as I'm planning to do it. Uh, these videos might actually just be my uh, <laughs> reminder anyway. I may not do that um, the way it's meant to be done, but at least I'll have a bit more information about how everything performed uh, for each season. So if you're ready, we'll, uh, we'll look at what I'm planting this season. So these are hopefully all in the groups they're supposed to be in. And uh, I've got all the little labels ready to go. There's quite a few here. Um, so I'll probably plant them over the next month or so. The best month in the tropics in Australia, where I am, uh, in the, wet, the end of the wet season into the dry season, something that takes a long time. Like there are things like tomatoes, which take 120 or so days to grow the plant and get the fruit so that you can harvest it and then you've got things like silver beet and spinach that are really fairly quick to give you leaves if you can just pluck off the outside ones uh, and keep it keep the plant going that way and not pull the whole plant out so it depends what you're planting as to when you would plant it but a lot of things can be planted in february march so i've got a couple of months um here the weather's pretty pretty easy coming into that um, the main thing you've got to worry about here is too much too much rain on the leaves of the plant as they're sprouting and and as they're going but I have found if it's a tiny little seedling it's actually a little bit tougher than a big plant if it gets too much rain on its leaves and I have a shade house which is made of shade uh, shade cloth uh, people also call them a bush house here but uh, it lets the rain through but it limits the sun and uh, on top I think it's 70% so 70% of the sun comes through um, and yeah that that protects them from excessive amounts of rain uh, but still lets, lets the light through for the little plants so the amount of rain that we get is not so bad for little plants but big plants you have to worry about that so here in the shoulder sort of season I mean it's only um, it's the end of January actually the first day of February today uh, so February, March, starting to plan for this, this garden coming up because seeds you have to start earlier than, than your plants if you're going to buy plants from the shop. Anyway, let's go for cucumbers, which don't grow well in the hot weather, but by the time these have sprouted and been transplanted into the garden beds, the raised garden beds behind me, ooh, you can just see them, uh, the plant will be bigger and it won't be bearing fruit in the hot weather it will be if I plant these in the latter part of the seeds that I plant in March um, these will be just fine in winter uh, winter here we get temperatures 
that are around plus or minus 20 degrees Celsius, which I haven't looked up. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. I really should learn how to convert it. But uh, yeah, pretty pretty mild. A bit more like a temperate temperate uh, area in autumn, our winter. Uh, so it does get colder at night though. And things don't grow as quickly in winter unless they're suited to it. So you can't stretch it too much, even though you can plant tomatoes. Anywho, Richmond Green Apple, which I don't always like, but I found this this variety is, um, these are our own seeds, so you can't see the packet, sorry. Um, they actually grow much better in the hotter weather, the Richmond Green Apple, at least in this area. So these are my own seeds that I saved from the last time I grew it. Uh, so I'm happy about that. I won't be planting any normal cucumbers just yet because I think it's still too warm. So in the eggplant family, we've got Rosa Bianca. So they're the ones, the eggplant has the streaky look to it. They're from Eden Valley Seeds. So that'll be good. Some more okra or okra, crimson spineless from DTB Seeds. Got some tamarillo seeds, which I got from my from my former mother-in-law. And their, their plant does really well. And they're in the Yarra Valley outside Melbourne in a temperate area in the southern part of Australia. And they grew, they grew quite well, the tamarillos. So I've got orange and purple from them. And I've got uh, red tamarillos from Coles, which is a supermarket here in Australia. And uh, they've sprouted before as well. But um, I didn't know when I first planted them that the plants were about that big when I put them out and they have quite large leaves. And um, they just weren't tough enough for the weather. It was just too hot. We got a, a heat wave in the middle of a heat wave now as well so you know gonna have to be a bit careful with these little plants I uh, have to keep the shade over them while they're growing up a little bit I think so for tomatoes I've got some cherry tomatoes already in the in the yard um, over the over this kind of period going into the dry season is when I'm planting my heritage my big tomatoes um, because they have a thinner skin and the fruit fly here really aren't around once they're with weather starts to really drop in temperature the fruit flies are not around as much around here so it's safer to plant the big heritage tomatoes so that they grow and fruit over winter here and um, just leave the cherry tomatoes with the thicker skin and they're more acidic just leave those to grow in the summertime because that's when the fruit fly around and they don't like the thick skin and they don't like I guess they can smell that they're more acidic uh, so yeah the uh, cherry tomatoes are pretty safe from fruit fly. I don't think I've ever seen them bitten by fruit fly, which of course rots and ruins the fruit. But I'm going to try paste tomatoes again. Last time I planted these San Marzano ones, nothing to do with the variety. Um, these are from DT Brown Seeds, DTB. Um, I planted them where little creatures could get at them through the fence and uh, they cut all their heads off. There are about 50 of them. So I thought, great, I'm going to plant a lot of a lot of uh, paste tomatoes so then you can make sauce and that sort of thing it has less seed less gel and more of the actual fruit uh, but yeah that did not work last year so I'm gonna try again this year with quite a few of those and I've had the ox heart tomatoes recommended to me by a few different people that I know uh, I have a friend who is going to bring me a couple of plants but uh, I'm not sure if he'll remember. He hasn't remembered a few other times. <laughs> Lovely guy. Um, so I'm going to plant some and have another another string to my bow if I need it. So here are the sweet melons that I'm going to plant in my old chicken yard, which I haven't shown you yet, which is coming along really nicely. Uh, I've been waiting for a bit more um, compost and that sort of thing so I can finish off that area. So but we will show it to you soon. All right, so we've got honeydew, which grew really well last year until the caterpillars got to it. So I'm going to try again. Sugar baby watermelon, all sweet watermelon, just for fun, a big one as well. Cicada sweet melon, my goodness. If anyone knows any tips about how to grow these, I would like to know. So these are World Kitchen seeds, which are more expensive than most. And they're, um, they're usually pretty good. So they're those kind of melon. Uh, I'm not sure, I've never tasted them, but they just look really good. So I've been uh, wanting to 
get those going for a while. I've, I've got the seeds sprouted and something, they must be really sweet. Something always eats it or it gets too hot, too cold. It hates cold nights. I've tried to grow it when, when the nights are still cold. No, it doesn't work. All right, so I've got Hale's Best Rock Melon Seeds from um, DTB. These are a really tough variety. So I'll have my own seeds from last time I grew them. And uh, these are the packet ones, so I'll see which ones I use. Or we'll use the oldest seeds anyway. All right, so squash, uh, as Americans call them, or pumpkins as we do, which are the, the um, people call them winter squash. And it doesn't mean they grow in winter. It means that you eat them in winter because they have a hard shell. If you leave them outside or in a in a sunny, airy place inside, we have we have so many little creatures that would eat them if I left them outside. So I actually cure my pumpkins inside after I pick them. Um, that way, little critters don't get them. So uh, the, speaking of critters, the critters have got these the last couple of times I've. I've grown them and I'm going to try again. These are baby boo pumpkins. They're only little ones um, and they're white and they've got the big ridges around them. Uh, so I'm really excited about those. Uh, I just like the idea of little things and uh, they're not practical. Um, but yeah, you know, pumpkin soup in a tiny little white pumpkin. I'm going to have to do that. It's just, that would just be so cool. All right. so. Spaghetti squash. These are my own, actually no, not my own seeds. These are my hubby. I wasn't even with my hubby and he knew my issues I'd had finding spaghetti squash seeds since found them online. But uh, he bought me a spaghetti squash fruit, which was not cheap at a fruit shop he was at with his daughters when he, he was out sightseeing. And um, yeah, so I have a lot of seeds, so I have no excuse now. I'm going to have to get the spaghetti squash going again. Um, you can roast them, and then you sort of scrape the middle out, and they're kind of like spaghetti, the, the pieces inside. So people on a low-carb diet uh, can feel like they're eating spaghetti, and it's actually pretty tasty. I am really impressed with these uh, Eden Seeds Golden Zucchini. We have had so much constant rain. Uh, I've got some growing in the garden at the moment. I'm going to plant some more. Um, and there's no powdery mildew at all on the leaves. And uh, it's even in my shady bed. So pretty excited about that. I haven't got any fruit from them yet, but I'm just going to stagger them and keep planting them. So um, because you can do that all year if they don't have issues with powdery mildew, which I'm really hoping they don't. So that's exciting. Um, I think I've said that a lot. I am excited about seeds. If you've got this far into the video, I'm guessing you're also excited about seeds. All right, golden nugget pumpkin. These are my own seeds, homegrown from 2014. So these seeds are, what, nearly eight years old? No, 10 years old. <coughs> Excuse me, talking too much. Um, but they're really sweet. Uh, they're a little pumpkin, bright yellow, bright orange, sorry. Uh, butternut. From the supermarket, these seeds I believe are the Waltham, Waltham cross, um, which are quite tasty. Those ones, um, grey pumpkins, so Queensland grey, big pumpkin, greyish, greenish, sort of like a sage colour. Um, lots of lots of um, pumpkin there in those ones. They're huge. Oh, a sweet melon that I forgot, Piello del Sapo, which actually translates as sweet melon or sugar melon so I just got those from the Russie's market I think from one that we purchased so hot chilies or hot peppers <coughs> excuse me talking too much I will keep going <laughs> so hot ones I've got Serrano from the seed collection uh, they succumbed to the last heat wave that we had. They must have needed way more water than I was giving them. Bird's eye chilies started out with those from the supermarket. Um, jalapeno from our previous ones that I that I've grown. They're pretty good. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Scotch bonnet chilies. Very hot, but hubby likes to put them just a little bit in things. <coughs> My goodness. I've been eating chilies myself, isn't it? 
So Carolina Reaper, they're the ones that I transplanted and one of them died so I'll just keep those coming along. Thai bullet chilies. I used to have a huge tree in Melbourne. It was against a <coughs> excuse me. Against a wall that faced east. So it was protected from the worst of the heat and the cold. Um, chocolate chili, the chocolate habanero, very, very hot. I actually used the last one as a bug spray to deter bugs. <laughs> I cooked it up with with some garlic. <coughs> Goodness. Cayenne uh, for my own seeds. Orange banana chilies, which are a long pointy sweet pepper that we use instead of a bell pepper or capsicum because um, the fruit fly don't get them as quickly because they fruit much they come to fruition much faster than the, than the uh, capsicums do oh there's a pineapple pin striped pineapple striped tomato which i should have told you about when i had the tomatoes in the wrong section Alrighty. Peas, we've got DTP snow peas, which in the tropics you really have to plant in winter. They don't do well in the hot weather at all. I mean that's a known thing, but I've tried to stretch it a couple of times and they just they just don't do well. Sugar snap, my hubby's favourite. I'm going to try to grow these in my shade house this year. <clears throat> and they might I might be able to extend the season a little bit more. To have more shade so that will be good all right onto the herbs oregano from DTB seeds uh, you might have seen one of my previous uh, uh, not sure which tour it was but I, I have actually killed some oregano which is pretty impressive because that's hard to do but I think it was because it was in a dish of water um, which usually saves seeds in the hot weather but it I don't know, got too hot, too wet, too something. But I'll try again. Oregano is usually really good here. It grows like a weed in the dry season, so it should be fine this season. Sweet basil does not grow very well in the in the um, dry season, but I'm going to give it another go because it just possums ate it. It's, it just must be the tastiest ever, the Genovese sweet basil, um, because, yeah. Grasshoppers love it. Uh, we usually use the Thai basil um, because that just grows like a weed here. But this this one is my favourite. <laughs> uh, but things keep eating it, so I'm going to try again, and hopefully I'll get a harvest of that sweet basil before everything stops growing. So yeah, that sweet basil uh, you might have heard me say on a previous um, garden tour that I grew it inside last winter. And it does grow, but not fast enough to be able to eat it. Uh, so you would have to grow a lot of it inside in winter. Because, uh, yeah, the cold nights, it just just does not thrive. So in the shoulder seasons is when I'm going to grow it because it just gets... Yeah, it has issues in summer as well. Uh, so, yeah, so autumn and spring, I'll, I'll try to get that going so that we'll get the most production in the warmest part of those times and try it that way. So basil verde, uh, small leaf, these are diggers seeds, I used to be in the diggers club when I lived in Victoria a long time ago. Um, just tiny tiny little aromatic basil, uh, I find it is actually hard to cook with though, it smells amazing, um, but the <laughs> little leaves are so tiny, it's like trying to cook with thyme but it doesn't come off easily, but uh, just for fun I'm going to plant those because those seeds are a little bit old. Salt bush is an Australian native, I believe. I got this from All Rare Herbs and I have planted it, no offense to them, I planted it about four times so far. But on the packet, when I got it out the other day, it actually says low germination. Uh, so they're not expecting much from it, but I've got them to sprout once. So I think I'll have to do a bit more research before I plant those as to the ideal time of the year to plant salt bush. So it's a, obviously it's a bush that grows quite big and it tastes salty and a lot of uh, chefs really like it for the uh, salty taste that it gives 
salty herby taste that it gives to the dishes. Summer thyme, which is much more hardy than normal thyme. It's fantastic, but it's actually died a couple of times. I do have a plant that's coming on, but just to, uh, to back that one up, I'm going to plant some more. Um, thyme actually does die off in winter here. A lot of plants go dormant here, so it does get cold enough to do that to plants. Um, mostly herbs are affected here in the tropics with that. And it's, again, it's because we're at the high elevation. So a lettuce leaf basil, which is similar to the very small... Oh, is that the big one? Mm. Ah, yes, that's the big leaf basil. Hopefully that works. Haven't had that for a while. Sage, I planted some way out the back. Ah, uh, this is Mr. Fothergill's seeds. I don't think you'll be able to get these seeds all over the world, I'm sure. Um, we just weren't using it, so I dried a bunch of sage. Still haven't used that, but just for the next season, in case that sage gets a bit old, I'm going to plant, plant just one or two bushes and see how that goes. Alrighty, so general fruit. I've got kiwi berries from the supermarket. Um, they're like kiwi fruit, but they're smooth. They don't have the hairy outside. Some people call them Chinese gooseberries. So it's a hairy fruit about that big sort of rectangular egg shape and um, a little bit tangy. Uh, you can get ones that are yellow inside, ones that are green inside. Uh, pack and pear, I've already got one of those going, but it's going to be sad. Um, but it is cool enough here to have pear, pears. And I've also got some cherry seeds ready to go from the supermarket because uh, you can grow them from seed and I believe they turn out well. They allegedly have them in Germany uh, lining the streets in some areas. I've forgotten exactly where I saw that when I googled it. And goji berry. I have managed to kill a number of these but I've got some more seeds and um, I'll give it another go. They're from the seed collection. Banana passion fruit also, also from the seed collection. Um, I'm having trouble sprouting this. There's actually a weed that keeps coming up in my little pots and I do reuse the soil in my pots that I plant seeds in uh, and I'm starting to think they might be banana passion fruit. I'll have to google what a small banana passion fruit looks like when it first comes up. So it's either that or it's a weed but I've saved the last two. I haven't thrown them away. So I'm really hoping that they're banana passion fruit and I won't have to plant those. Uh, I'm going to plant some more capsicum or um, bell peppers, as Americans call them. Um, Californian Wonder by DTB, DT Brown Seeds. I should have mentioned these earlier. We do have four of these plants in the garden, but just in case something happens to those, I'm going to plant a couple more. So, I'm going to look at some brassicas and that sort of thing. Oh, first we've got onions, so they're in the Allium family. So Hunter River Brown onions seem to do really well here. I've got Tolga Red. Um, people call them shallots, so they look like that. Um, I planted some and got them up recently and then they died in the heat wave, unfortunately. They were even in the shady bed, so I'm going to try it again. I think something was also eating things in that garden bed. Um, pickling onions, Mr. Fothergills. They're a small white onion, so they fit in the jars more easily, I guess. Um, these have been really good. Um, even the Hunter River brown onions, just the normal brown onions, uh, some of them didn't grow very well last year. I said that in one of my garden tours. And um, they were teeny tiny, and the tops were flopping over, and so they start to rot after the tops flop over if you leave them in the garden so I had to harvest them. So you have these tiny little normal onions and I found a British pub recipe um, with malt vinegar to be able to pickle them and um, yeah they turned out really well so I'm excited I want to plant some more pickling onions. Uh, red onion from DT Brown. Uh, elephant leek. These apparently I can plant this time of the year which surprised me. Uh, they are from Mr. Fothergill's Giant Elephant Leek. And um, yeah, it says in the tropics you can sow them in summer and autumn, which was very surprising. I have not had a lot of 
um, a lot of success with leeks here. I think it's just not cold enough or long enough and they either don't sprout or don't do well and they just get they just get too hot for too long I think. Um, considering it can grow in the leeks can grow in the snow. I've seen a, an English gardener with those so they ain't gonna grow so well in the tropics perhaps. A pretty little butterfly. Oh and some thunder. That's, that's exciting. Kohlrabi I've grown before which is a fantastic thing to grate and um, put in a salad like a, a vinaigrette uh, coleslaw. Uh, that's an Asian yeah an Asian vegetable so it's a root vegetable. I've got white kohlrabi too I think but I'm not sure if I'm going to plant it this time. That's kohlrabi. Yeah so that'll be exciting. Uh, what else have I got? This seems like an awful lot of seeds but I only plant one or two little pots with about five seeds in each and then I divide them out and then yeah if they're in there for a while and once they're big enough I'll usually get them straight from where they sprouted as a seed into the garden once they're little seedlings. Uh, silver beet, ford hook, giant um, from a seed person online actually. I won't say who that is because the other seeds she sent me were mouldy. Um, those ones were okay but the corn seeds? Mm -mm. Anyway, uh, be careful buying seeds online from a place that are not seed people. Um, daikon radish or oriental oriental radish people call them. They're the, they look like a big white carrot and they're kind of horseradishy flavour. My chickens love the leaves of those which is fantastic because it's dual purpose. So these are interesting. Chinese celery. So Min Minara. Minara Seed Company. So it just looks like celery but it's very skinny. And I'm thinking it may not need, um, it says it needs a fair bit of water, but it might be um, faster growing than normal celery. And it doesn't look like you need to blanch the edges by, you know, putting cardboard or straw around the, the uh, celery stalks to keep them pale. So that's a bit less work and things that grow quickly get less bugs usually because they don't have time to come and get your plants. This is um, dwarf bok choy, which I've mentioned in a garden tour before. They're from Minara Seeds as well. My hubby found those um, when he was somewhere for work. So Kale, um, my son-in-law, gave me a little packet of seeds when he was dating my daughter. Now they've been they're going out about three, three years. Been married three years and I've still got these seeds he gave me uh, <laughs> when he first got to know her. So they're still going so strong. They're um, curly leaf kale and red, no they're red Russian kale so they're sort of pinky purple on the edge of the frilly leaves and they grow sort of quite separately to most most kale kind of things. This is choy sum which grew like a weed last year, this is my own seed that I've collected from the seed pods. Um, I love choy sum, it's great with um, garlic and soy sauce. Um, just sautéed. Um, pak choy, red pak choy. Jess from Roots and Refuge said it's a very good trap crop so I might try that. Might try that theory although I think something went wrong with that idea with her recently so I'm hoping it'll work out anyway. So uh, Taiwanese saitai, Minara seeds. My friend from Singapore will perhaps be able to correct me if that's wrong. So it looks like Kind of looks like a lettucey bok choy, sai tai, from Taiwan. Although that's a contentious subject at the moment. This is Taiwan. Um, Tuscan kale from Johnson Seeds. Um, I believe people also call this um, dinosaur kale. And uh, yeah, it's super tough. I'm not sure if that's the same as walking stick kale. The one that I had, I actually got sick of it being in the garden for so long. It was growing for so long uh, and I pulled it out uh, and then I missed it because my chickens love it. Hubby doesn't like kale very much. But yeah, the chickens are pretty excited. And my chickens also like anything that's mustardy or rocket. They love that. These are just Hoyt's uh, seeds from the 
from the spice section in the supermarket and they grow really well they're nice to add to uh, salads and that sort of thing so I've got golden sunrise beetroot the one in my previous one of my previous garden tours that got eaten by slugs and snails I'm gonna try again and I might put them in their shade house because there are less slugs and snails uh, up there that's from the seed collection as well some pack toy uh, my own seed that I collected some more red Russian the other one must have been curly leaf from my son-in-law Chinese broccoli from the seed collection uh, I've been doing a bit of research and I think that will be really good because around here you get a lot of uh, grasshoppers in summer but you get slugs and snails in winter so I think this will do the shoulder season thing uh, so Chinese broccoli uh, has sort of like shoots of like little bunches of florets I think of broccoli that come out the side so you can eat the stem and it just has a little bit of the broccoli buds on top and you can eat the other stem and you can eat the leaves of it as well so instead of just one big head of broccoli in the middle which I don't grow uh, broccoli or cauliflower because it's too warm here and it, you have to get the exact time it's like carrots the exact time to plant it for it to work um, but something like this Chinese broccoli I think will work because um, you can start getting the little stems and the leaves and you can eat them you don't have to wait for the big head and all of the bugs to leave it alone long enough for you to get one head from like a big plant I don't have enough space in my garden to give to plants that just hog space space hogs people call them summer lettuce uh, this is my own seed but it was originally from plants that my neighbor gave me so she gave it to me because it's lettuce that grows in the tropics lettuce can be very difficult you kind of have to grow it in the shade and watch it as if it's your little baby because <laughs> lettuce is not especially tough here and it goes straight to seed usually most times of the year except winter so my hubby's kind of sad that it's really good to grow lettuce in the winter because <laughs> he doesn't want to eat salad in winter but maybe we'll eat more salad would be more be more healthy so uh rocket it's just just looking at this really dirty tag dtb seeds i love rocket in a salad uh hubby doesn't mind it but uh he doesn't really like peppery leaves but i do so i'll grow some for myself <laughs> here's alfalfa um this is a really big sign that I made out of my um, butter container system that I use where I, where I cut up the butter container. It's um, <coughs> alfalfa, I believe is exactly the same thing as lucerne is, uh, but they call it alfalfa when it's sprouted for, you know, like those little, little fine plants that you put on your sandwich for alfalfa. That's Mr. Fothergill's. Um, often if you buy things that are a big packet to make those sprouts with, it's the same plant. So it's actually a lot cheaper to buy the big packets for sprouting um, microgreens. Uh, yeah, just to use in your garden as normal. So I'll be giving them to us and the chickens. Often if something goes too far gone, like I've got some collars in the garden still, which shouldn't be there in summer. But the chickens are still eating them, so I'm happy. You know, chickens will eat them. Uh, Spigarello is called, also called leaf broccoli. No, that's not leaf. Leaf broccoli, I think. Yes, yes, yes. So these are my own seeds from last season. Big seed, big, big, big leaves, and the chickens love them too. Well, I mean, we could eat them, but hubby doesn't like a lot of brassicas. So um, this is Tiger Saste. This is a really long story, uh, but I'll give you the short version. Um, I was looking for making it with my, um, yeah, with my research online, making it, growing it, and it was hard to find seeds. And then the seed collection had some, so I was really excited. And then I was talking to my neighbor and she has horses. So I was gonna grow it for my chickens. It's also called tree lucerne. So it's a fodder plant. And I'm not sure which other animals you could give it to. I won't recommend because I don't know. But chickens and horses, it's okay. And it grows on a big bush and she's from New Zealand. So she was excited because she's tried to grow it um, and wasn't able to sprout it successfully and keep it going. It's, it's quite fussy. It seems to need a lot of um, TLC, but I'm starting to get it going. So I'll grow it for myself and my, my neighbour. 
Um, so I've got some going, but yeah, I need a backup plan. Strawberry spinach, which is like spinach, small little spinachy leaves, which I'm not really growing it for, but I'm growing it for the little strawberry kind of fruit that grow on it. So that'll be exciting. That's from the seed collection. Apparently you can make jam out of them, but like hubby said, you can make jam out of anything. <laughs> which is true, you know, get enough sugar in something. I'm trying not to eat too much sugar, so I'm just hoping they're nice to eat by themselves. So English spinach, spinach, Medina spinach from Country Value Seeds. And I have a whole bunch of flowers. And I'm not sure if you all want to see all my flowers. But anyway, I'll do a quick version because this video is already quite long. So I've got Love in the Mist from a place uh, in Tasmania. Uh, Persian Jewel, so lots of different colours. Uh, often they're only pink or blue, but they're, they're purple and other, other things. Bergamo or bee balm. Echinacea, I'm growing some for my friend, Mr. Fothergills. Red velvet sunflower, which will be amazing. Mr. Fothergills seeds. So that'll be just, just something that'll be nice. Uh, Snapdragon, that's, that's my own seed from Snapdragons that I've grown before. Uh, blue cornflower. Nigella seeds, blue nigella, so the seeds in the flower, they're related to love in the mist I think, actually. Um, you know when you get seeds on your on the top of a bun, uh, what you do in the supermarkets here and the, the bakeries, and they look like sesame seeds but they're not, and they almost taste like coriander, I love those, and that's what these are, they're nigella seeds. So my hubby knows a lot about food so he told me that. Uh, some more borage. Uh, I have two plants of borage and they keep coming back but they struggle in the heat. Um, sweet peas. Love sweet peas. Had them in my wedding bouquet. Uh, I have to, you have to make sure that they're not just grown for the flower. If they're grown for the um, fragrance as well, uh, that would be good because that's usually why most people grow them. So calendula, calendula that's orange calendula with a green center. Digger seeds again, so they'll be at least eight years old. California poppy, they're beautiful. They're white with a yellow center, these ones. Heartsies, which are Johnny Jump Ups, the tiny little, I think they're violas, are they the same as violas? They look like a tiny, tiny little pansy and they're little plants like that big. They're so sweet. All right, poached eggplant. More snapdragons. Billy buttons that I got in a card from someone really cool when you get seeds in a card that's actually a part of it. Paper daisies which are an Australian native that my daughter gave me. Californian poppies. My goodness so many. This is a snapdragon that popped up in a mix uh, that has very leaves which is really weird. It's a creamy coloured flower. It was really nice. And we've got some gazanias which look like daisies and some gerberas. Gee this looks like all of my seeds doesn't it? I'm going to try these for the first time, Aquilegia, DT, DT Brown Seeds, and Australian Flower Mix, DT Brown. This might take a couple of couple of months to get all this going. I'm going to try corn because my best success with corn was through winter because uh, it, keeps, it keeps raining through summer. And some more beans, so some snap beans, Madagascar beans, I've already got some of those. Yeah, they're from Seed Savers, the seed group that I'm in. Um, they're growing like a weed down in the old chicken coop area. So I've got some black eyed beans, climbing beans, and three corns of garlic because garlic only grows over winter here. And I'm um, going to give those a go. So that was the, the very fast version. <laughs> I could have talked probably for a couple of hours on that, but I don't think you want to see that. But anyway, thanks for watching. That's what I'm planting next over the next couple of months, and I'll report back on how they're going. Hope you have an awesome day. Thanks a lot. Catch you next time.